Welcome everyone to July's Everyone Has a Voice. We have a packed house today. We are on poet's time, which means we're going to be late. <laughs> but we have a great open mic. We have our youth poets who are going to be reading for us. We have our regular poets. It's going to be an amazing afternoon. And it is my pleasure to turn it over to my co-host today, Kelly Gates, who is the head of the adult services at Brockton High. I mean, Brockton Library, I'm sorry. Brockton Library. So, Kelly Gates. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we have a great list for the open mic today. Uh, we're going to go a little bit at random, mix it up. Uh, but I am pleased to start with Joyce Wilson. Thank you so much um, for this gathering. I have uh, two poems. I'm going to read two unpublished poems. Uh, they're a little controversial. Um, they're uh, inspired a lot by the George Floyd controversy and Black Lives Matter. Um, after his death, I, uh, I post a um, poetry magazine on the internet called The Poetry Porch. And for the cover, I had this slide that my father had taken in 1959 of an octagonal house that was a church for African Americans in the town where I grew up, Chadsford, Pennsylvania. And so I've done research on this church. I didn't know that much about it. It's total ruins now. But the ruins have been stabilized by the Historical Society. And it was a AME church, African Methodist Episcopal Church, for the um, African Americans who lived in the area. After the Civil War, um, the community was largest in the 30s and 40s. And I was kind of aware of this when I was growing up. And uh, it just strikes me now that it's this connection I had um, to Reconstruction, to the Civil War, to the blacks who had left slavery directly to come to this area in Pennsylvania. And I've since found out that a lot of them were from a Bird family, a family called Bird, um, who were from this plantation, the Westover Plantation in Virginia. So I'm still doing all this research on it, but um, so bear with me. This is what I've gotten so far. History lesson, Mother Archie's Church. Important to the free black as to the slave was the church. And that's from John Hope Franklin in his book, From Slavery to Freedom. She bought the school building from the township and made it a church with pews in two rows, their backs to the entrance, yet facing the pulpit, its cushion of purple velvet, the Bible, and jovial pot-bellied stove. And the thing about this building was it was an octagonal shape with eight sides. Above the octagonal space, the rafters met at the peak in the center, supporting the chandelier. The seven walls were made with seven windows, the eighth a door, shut fast against the cold. The lamp inside the church was radiant, a lantern beckoning to those who hurried by to enter the house that Mother Archie built where they could be free and make themselves at home. Plantation owners had discouraged slaves' expression of religious ecstasies. At last they found the church they'd been denied with black preacher determined and ordained. She preached of resurrection and she preached of forgiveness. The stories that they loved the most were the prophets and the kings of men whom God had called to lead the way out of the house of bondage of Moses and his vision of the vibrant promised land. They lived these stories as they stood to pray and sang these words, Lord, let my people go. The blacks had been coming to this place since before the Civil War. Historians would call them quasi-free. Their self-determination was another thing. Their lives had been dependent on the land and whites who gave them jobs for ready cash as economic changes came to some, the congregation shrank and disappeared. 
Three decades after Mother Archie's death, the roof and walls collapsed around the stones. The township voted to protect the space and save the church, its people, and their names. And I'll read uh, one other, if I can find. Um, this was um, one of the parishioners. Um, there was a rumor when I was growing up that um, one of our neighbors died in a snowbank of hypothermia. They say he fell asleep on his way home, oblivious to danger and drowsy from the cold, embracing groceries, the sacks of beans and rice that he would place upon the shelves and crowded tabletop. The kitchen would bustle with activity, yet he did not get there, for they found him buried under winter's drift, a crypt made prematurely, molded to his shape, the snow a shawl of crystal confection. To think of all the stories he could tell, outlining how it happened, that he stopped to sit down so late in the day to rest, wrapped in impressions of familiar steps, though nowhere near the comfort of his bed. We can see the parlor, blazing fire, where he would settle in and warm himself, and wipe snow from his eyes, and clear his throat, as we arrive to gather round his chair, to listen to the marvels of his tale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from one of our youngest poets, Ivan Zizak. I heard one of his poems last month at the June. Um, everyone has a voice, so I'm really excited to hear what we have today. All right, welcome, Ivan G. Good afternoon. So the poem that I'm going to be reading for you today it's a poem that's talking about really life in Brockton and really a description of Brockton overall, but the thing is I still haven't found a title yet, so if you guys could think of one while I'm reading this, it would be quite of help. All right. <coughs> Brockton, a city in Plymouth County, Massachusetts, incorporated in 1881, it makes no excuses. Known as the City of Champions, it's focused on education, industry, and making progress, a fact that's no surprise to its hardworking residents and its 22 square mile address. Bustling, Brockton life is very busy. The thrill and rush here can make newcomers feel dizzy. From festivals to sports, there are activities galore. When you're here, life is never a bore. Rich history in our city is found everywhere. All around us, you can find something right here and over there. Brockton became a city on April 9th, 1881, 140 years ago, but our story is not done. Opportunities present themselves all around. All over the city, they're easily found. Numerous arts and culture opportunities easy to get, like auditioning for the Brockton Symphony Orchestra for your clarinet. City of Champions is a title that Brocktonians are proud to bear, something we promote like our famous history as the hub of footwear. We have marvelous Marvin Hagler and Rocky Marciano, our Brockton blockbuster. In our prize-winning city, life is never lackluster. Known for education, industry, and progress, our city strives for success. Hardworking, a quality trait that most Brocktonians possess. We have around 17,000 students in schools, providing them with many useful tools. Tons of destinations to go with many historic places. The Fuller Craft Museum displays art, pottery, and vases. There's the Westgate Mall and City Hall, beautiful in every season from winter to fall. One of the nation's best communities, named by the Americans Promise Alliance. Brockton is a city that provides children with valuable guidance. Adults who advise them, nurture and protect and encourage them. We have chances to serve others, which causes a feeling of self-respect and service to STEM. Notable, in our si notable people in our city are found aplenty. Mary E. Baker, first African-American to work at City Hall, the first of many. 
Bill McGonigal, inventor of the baseball glove, created something new. There have been many notable people who resided in Brockton, not few. Brockton, a bustling city full of rich history. Filled with opportunities, its reputation as the city of champions is no mystery. One of the nation's top communities known for education, industry, and progress, home to many notable people with tons of places to go, life in Brockton is the best. Thank you. Can we uh, offer a title? <laughs> yeah. Maybe our, our history is not done, or a city whose history is not done. All right. Or my, my city. Okay, hey, thank you very much. And I'm also pleased to mention that Ivanchi is going to be one of our student feature poets coming up. We are taking a break next month. In September, we'll be returning to the art gallery at the main library. So I hope to see you all there. Um, so that was very Brockton centric, which was wonderful. But now we are going to call up a poet that has traveled from New Hampshire. Uh, so please welcome Phil Dwyer. I'm actually visiting my home in Merrimack, from, but I'm from California these days. Um, this is great to be here, thank you. I have three uh, poems I'd like to share. Um, the first is called Make a Wish. How family and friends prepare almost gives the secret away prior to the moment when perfect timing can take you all the way home. Before piled memories started their internal banter, like cake batter rises and swells when baked to tear in spongy layers, held together by your desires, spread like glue, icing all the changing moments year after year, blended together to illuminate your very own special day, applauding your first shocking breath on your first air day upon the earth. Hearts open wide, wide when gifted by anyone who comes within your party, so serve it sliced on a platter heaped high with youth frosted dreams, bound to the earth, winging circles, increasing in speed every time round the sun, another year tolls its lessons in flames, heady with lyrics sung, dewy for celebrants, ruminating about a life lived between yummy breaths, sweet talking wishes on stars, sprinkled over seasons, shooting across your life's uncorked bottle of effervescent puffs upon the earth. <laughs> Breath has been very much on our minds <laughs> these last couple of years. Um, this one uh, could have been called The Seven Steps of Instinctive Archery, but I didn't care for that title. Um, and The Seven Steps, Stance, Knock, Grip, Draw, Anchor, Release, and Hold. If you stay, uh, you'll, you might catch those in here. Um, and the term bullseye I discovered um, some folks say might have come from um, sort of me medieval archery. A good shot was to be able to shoot through the eye socket of a bull's skull. So you might catch a little. And the eye uh, in this poem might be referring to a different one, so stay tuned. <laughs> aiming via not aiming. Alive on the earth I stand, centered between left and right, feet spread shoulder width apart. Being right-handed, I turn my left foot out to open my chest space to the full range of all in front of me. While sensing the world, I reach for the knot receiving end of an arrow, keying on the unique colored feather, I align the shaft centered on the bowstring for balanced flight, all the while remaining watchful of the landscape, both inner and outer always mindful to point sharpened heads in safe, grounded directions. One hand holds the loaded bow, the other grips the taut string nestled in its fingertips. 
ahead and behind stretch all around as I pull backward in parallel with a push forward. My concentration moves toward form. I am stands centered in an archetype, the poised archer with long drawn out arms, tensioned tight like springs, fulcrumed on an upright spine, stretched between earth and blue sky. Mine strives for the center of self, of place, of destiny, unites multiplicity and anchors in paradox. Yearning for optimum thrust into the heart of this world, I spread wide open to be penetrated while stilling my focus on its core, peace and relax. Release results. When strains accepted, the shaft bends with the shock, flies free and straight. If I hold true and still, rooted in earth like a tree, the skull of my bull's eye is pierced. I reach for another. I'll wrap up with COVID Dio. <laughs> my mind conjugates with heart to image life. I look out at pictures and see them zooming back at me. We pixelate, screen, stack, and pigeonhole ourselves like headstones, wired tight for sound transmission without air, waves. Still, I open my intranet. My moist lungs suck deep at 2020's whirlwinds, oscillate and sip and sip and sip. I breathe in my idea of life my memories of it, my movies of it, the ineffable magnitude of it. Life heats my blood, rises in me, and I fantasize you. Your sense, your drive to be, breathes across the void a little with me. Thank you very much, Phil. Now I'm going to say that our uh, poetry events draw poets all the way from California. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so next up, I would like to welcome Sheila Twyman. I have a large backyard that backs up to a woods. We have a lot of flying vermin. Um, but what we don't have, though, are bees. And I discovered, you probably have heard of oh deer that comes around and sprays. And it's a concentrated uh, uh, cedar wood oil. And I was told that as long as the bees are not flying in direct line of the spray, they're fine. But if they happen to be in direct line of the spray, they will take it. I've been finding a lot of dead bees around. Um, so this is a cautionary tale, not necessarily due to oh dear. <clears throat> I'm she whose body leaves no trail on dews, those mornings when the treacle scent of bloom has lured me into heady rendezvous with amber nectar for the honey room. I'm she who dances circles in my hive to share the locus of my floral odors with all the others able to survive the daily threats our habitat endures. I'm she who pollinates great fields of grain that feed the hordes of hungry on this earth. But humans, you treat this world with such disdain, I find it may no longer give you birth. Beware. I am your sword of Damocles, Apis, Mellifera, land, lust of the honeybees. And I used to ride the subway train into Boston a lot years ago. <clears throat> and this was something that I observed while waiting for a train one afternoon, waiting for the tea. 
unfazed by smacking wet lips, tongue licking her long pale neck, she stands obelisk straight. On two-inch platform sandals, stares into space beyond the leering, stroking man, old enough to have a daughter her age with skin-tight jeans, crop top cut to belly button gem, hair streaked to latest shade blue, falling on yogurt-fed tits, bas relief through thin nylon canvas for a single red rose she holds in parallel. I've done it all, purple nails, look, touch, sculptured Aphrodite, marble. And this also was something from the subway, 2 a.m. The sax man's solitary amoeba notes slide across graffiti walls, around cement columns, along undeviating tracks to where I stand in shadows, waiting for the train to remove me to my room, where guppies hide in orange plastic algae and purple castles with no doors. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. So next up, we are going to hear from someone in our library family, our very own trustee, <coughs> Joseph Polake. Would you like to come up and join <coughs> us? Please welcome. I have to let you know that I'm going to try to read, but I already realize I can't see much. Um, my doctor said that I only have 30% left with my eyesight. So I'm legally blind, but I want to force myself to do something. <laughs> Who am I? So many people have asked me that question. I try my best with God's love to answer it faithfully. But I have been vivid, livid in my reflections. In a spot, nature have sheltered me gracefully. My mother had four children with my father, and I was the last. He left my mother when I was three months in the womb. When I am talking about my ch childhood, my heart beats fast. Thanks, goodness. This psychological chaos one takes me to my tomb. I am the fifth of seven children of my mother. Mother prepared clothes for a girl when I was a boy. I am the 13th of multiple children of my father. Mother carried me for nine months in her arms with joy. I fell from my mother's like a chicken dropping. Her eggs, she was on her way to see my grandfather. <coughs> Grandpa ran down to see what was happening. Grandpa could not believe what his eyes saw. I fell on the ground. I did not cry or move at all. My mother thought I was not alive or a monster. Grandpa called to heaven, oh, St. Jack, St. Paul, something is wrong with the baby, called a doctor. My eyes were opened. A veil covered my face. Some feared that I was going to become powerful. As I opened my eyes, Grandma said, he is full of grace. It is one out of a million who has this veil. Ah, wonderful. My father feared that I was not his child. My mother now had a new boyfriend. My father was looking at me. He bent closer. I smiled. He might be mine, he thought, 
as he looked at me again. My father allowed me to carry his name, but after the baptism, he disappeared for a while. When he returned in my life, I realized he was not to blame. I was a handsome boy, but seemingly without his profile. My stepdad hated me and wanted me that to die. And I was je jealous of watching my father visited my siblings. My stepdad felt I hit him each time I look at him with my little eyes. One day, he put his foot on mine and called me awful things. I became a beautiful boy that made people smile, but neither my father nor my, step, my stepfather cared I existed. People laugh when I try to imitate my father Style. I had a big stomach, but a skeletal boy, skinny and twisted. My stepfather hated me, and another time he put his foot on me, and it hurt. Mother said nothing. I decided to leave my mother to go to my father. But before I was out, I looked at my stepfather and said, your feet are dirty. I did, not sh I did not short stab him. I also told him he could never, never be my father. I was six years old. I arrived at my dad's place. I was very small. My stepmother did not want me, nor did dad or siblings. My father said, where are you going with your big face? By the time I took a chair and sat, I was called all kind of, of things. My father said, you must leave my house. You are not my son. Well, you think I am not your son? This is not what my mother told me. My father moved closer to me. Do you want to stay here? And for how long? And beside, I took I I look just like you. Can you see? I don't have my glasses on. My father said, "I can't see if you look like me or not." When you made me, did you have your glasses on? I said to Dad. My father looked up. He looked down, and he was hot. Oh, okay, my father said, who told you to come here and make me mad? Nobody taught me to tell, you, to tell you that. I know you are my father. I don't want to live with my stepfather, dad, anymore. I need you. My father looked, my, my brother Louis came forward. I want, I want him. And I, I want to, uh, him and I want to sleep together. My father looked at my stepmother. She also looked at my, fa at my father. And he, she shook her head to say, he wants you. My father took my hands while looking at me on the face. I never seen a child so convincing you are a little demon. What about your mother? Uh, he said, you will never see her again. My mother is living just over there. Are you dreaming? Father did not say a word again. My sister, Melanie, uh, grabbed me. You are going to be my son. Is that OK? She asked me politely. Louis pulled my other hands. We, we are going to sleep. You see, at first, no one seemed to like me. And then everyone accepted me nicely. I grew up 
with my father and my stepmother, but I always felt I missed something. I never felt my father was fully comfortable at my presence or my mother. I felt once I, I left once and moved back with my, with my own mother and my other siblings. I am feeling guilty for surviving. I lost four of my siblings, one after the other. I am a piece of a puzzle. Even now, I'm still dreaming, sucking my mother's breast. But I'm always watching behind me of someone that will grab it from me. I am always looking for my father in my dream. I will never rest. When I would finally see him in my dream, there is always an, an empty space between him and I. Thank you. Since it is long, I'm just going to read one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joseph. I would also like to take this opportunity to mention that Joseph will be participating in our Voices of Diversity event this November. Um, we are going to have poets reading in more than 10 languages, um, poets of all different ages, academic poets, performance poets. It's going to be an amazing event, so I hope to see you all there. And you can look forward to more details about that soon. Uh, so next up, I would like to call uh, Jason Wright to read. Hey everybody, how's it going? I've got, uh, I've got a couple poems, so this is uh, Jagged Thought 380, The Word Society, and this is just published on my website, oddballmagazine.com. It's weird publishing every raw thing, not looking at it to say, does this poem sing? Could it sing better if I let it free? It's like the police when I wave peace and they throw sheets on me and say chaos reigns, I say no, knowledge reigns supreme. I look like I talk human. I sit around my four-cornered room waiting for the movement. I breathe, in, breathe into life these words and they sing sonnets off key. They say chaos reigns. I say no, knowledge reigns supreme. I look at me and I look just how I look breathing. I have a heartbeat. When I run it beats fast and when I turn a disease into something like a soul release, I let it feed into me. I let my soul release out of me, not looking for an exit strategy, I write because that makes me move. It soothes me, it comforts me, and it shows my skeleton, not my skin. It stains my world with color when I am muted. It takes me away from the world, it makes me feel less disconnected. Because when I connect with my pen, it all makes sense. It makes me feel like me, and you might be friends. It takes away the emptiness, puts something over that lens. So I can look beautiful, cover up my scars, the meds, the places I have been, the darkness. I take a look at why I write and why I survive each night shift, each night break and day lift, each sunshine and silence I sit. I meditate, not sitting with my legs straight and quiet. I let out my violence in my writing. I let out the poet and here he sits with a society of words, friends on a page. Each word more friends join the endless game. One drops off, one begins again. The poet finds friends in the words he pens, and that's why I write. Because it's Friday night, and I may or may not go on, knowledge reigns supreme, but knowledge will always reign supreme. KRS knows what he means when he says the MC and the poet share the same space. One does it quietly with his hands on the keys, listening to the MC while the others spit it out like flames, maintains the crowd, and kills the stage. I am the latter. I am not mad villain. I am the mad hatter. I write to the beat of my heart and the stomp and stampede of medicinal minds that come into me and give me space to speak. I am free, if only in this poetry am I free. There is nothing but reels and reels of endless blank sheet. And as long as I have a heartbeat and a pen and two feet, two hands to type the keys, I will join the word society every time I write. I'll challenge my mind every time I sit and type. As long as there is blood coursing through my veins and electrical impulses from my brains, I'll be one with the society of words, the society of nouns and verbs. Thanks. So my book, Train of Thought 2, just got released, and it's available now. 
and I have some with me, so that's really cool. It was available on my website, and I just got it today. So, and it's from this book, Train of Thought One. So, Train of Thought Two. This one's shiny. This one's matte. Mm -hmm. This one's basically they're like negatives of each other. So if you look at them, it's like they're superimposed. Anyway, so the last poem of Train of Thought goes like this. It says. Something like a dream. Today I will melt in the 103 degree weather. Today I will break down this puzzle and put it all together. Today I fight for what my name is. Today I'm the realist and I feel like this, like I'm the truest poet to ever live because I live this shit and survive it. Some can live. Some get by. Some try too hard to fly but fill their head with drugs and misstep like stepping and slipping on the train tracks. You realize that this is it. One slip, you're finished. There's only one life I know of. So all the other stuff... Fill your heart with love. And maybe we'll meet one day, someday by some dumb luck. And I will give you a poem and you will give me a hug. And I will say that I wrote this poem for you and glad that you read my book. And beauty is only skin deep. Sometimes you need to take a closer look. And maybe you'll see the scars on my arms are far less than yours. And that is because I was given this gift to write these rhymes. I use my pen as a sword to kill the negativity. Refill me when this world has gotten too much for me. And yeah, I have to take medications. And yeah, it might be different. But the gift this, that God gave me is the reason I'm still living. And the ink isn't drying before the next page is written. So that's, that's the end of this book. And this is the first page of this book. So it's um, reborn. I am reborn. So, so real quick, um, this ends at Central MGH. And this one picks up a Kendall because I was on the red line. So. I am reborn. My life may be torn, I may have grown old, the warmth has gone cold, but I am reborn. Generated like a science age old, but never told the science itself. I learned today how much it takes me to break down. Learned today how to rebuild in this world I live, this mental dome guarded by medicated angels. Each weathered word passed down from me to her, and she gets the product, a project that makes nothing seem like everything's gone wrong, but the truth is I'm learning to live. It was raining pouring down the remains of the day onto my borrowed umbrella. I'll promise I'll give it back, Marie, I said, and got up from my desk to leave. I wrote on a notepad, today will be a new day. When I see it tomorrow, it'll make me smile. It'll put me in the right place. I just need to learn how to slow to a crawl. Then Grouch and Eli rock the track I'm listening to, and I'm back to writing the truth. I will let you know at the end of this book. Thank you, Jason, for sharing. Uh, so the next poet that I'm going to welcome, we also heard from in June. Uh, so I know that we're in for a treat. So I'd like to welcome Anjali Andrade. Hi, everyone. Yes, I was here last week, but now I've written a new poem. Well, actually, written three new poems. This is one of them, but the other two I have in my side of the couch in the pocket, and the poem that I wrote for this week, I couldn't get it out of my head, so I had no choice to write it at 12 a.m. again. <laughs> so here's how it goes. Poetry friends. Poetry is not just about rhyming, but it's also about perfect timing. Some people are under pressure to get it right as they think the space around them gets tight and they get lost in the darkness of the night. They wake up again in their own bed with the fright and everything unwinds, but God reminds us that life is a roller coaster. That one summer day that it will be as hot as the inside of a toaster. Then the ghosts will haunt you saying, just pick up your pencil and paper. The space will no long be, longer be tight. But if you never listen and then you just saw the light, you wake up in the hospital and they tell you that you fainted. You look at your favorite shirt and skinny jeans and they are both faded. But you thank God that you made it. Thank you very much. Uh, so next I would like to ask Dana Rowe to come up and share.
Thank you. Um, so this summer I've been uh, writing some Zen-related poetry, mostly haiku. Uh, got into a group on Facebook. You might look it up. It's called Zen Poetry. And, uh, you know, if you come on down and take a look, and the administrators will approve your request to be a member. Join us and do these things. At any rate, uh, I'm, I'm not going to start with a haiku. It came up in conversation a little earlier this afternoon, so I'm going to start with uh, Cambodian Patiavat. Four syllables, four lines, the middle two lines rhyme. But you're going to find out that I don't always write in that Zen format because I write about what I do. Heat awakens. Sunrise. Fly free. Kawasaki. Rushing air cools. Okay. So, yes, I was over there. And so that inspired this one. For the past 40 odd years, I've been working on something that will cover this better. But right now, you're getting a haiku. Conqueror surveys, locals' eyes rise, meet with his, both forever altered. Okay, one of them about me. Uh, well, they're all about me. Actually, they were our poets. Isn't everything we write about us? At any rate, back when I was working on the railroad. Hump yard, consist waits. Couplers clash, pin drops, locked in. Cicadas shout praise. Mile post 58 on the Cape Main Line. Okay. And then another thing that I've been doing. Asphalt oval track. Go fast. Turn left. Checkered flag. A day at the beach. Give us summer moon. Peaks between bedroom curtains. Finish to good rain. And one for us all. Disillusionment. Workers' sense of artistry faded by progress. And finally, Atanka, which is a haiku with, seven, with five lines instead of three. Back to the railroad. Actually, this one uh, on Zen poetry uh, got me talking with uh, a new friend from Brisbane, Australia, who also likes trains down under. Donner Pass Snowsheds, SP Cab Forward Malay, whistle cries past lake, hoggard tugs throttle open, fireman valves in feed. Thank you for sharing, Dana. Thank you for teaching me something new today. Um, next is my pleasure to welcome up our very own Philip Hosaurus. Before I read uh, my poems, um, please a big round of applause for director Paul Engel uh, for giving us this space. our appreciation to Kelly Gates for running the open mic smoothly. So after my poems, um, we're going to take a little short break, and then uh, we're going to hear from Yaya and Jean Denis and Leonardo. So this first poem was inspired uh, by the library. Portals of Dusted Pages. I read to you in whispers, you 
lean against words, portals of dusted pages, this craving, encircled by, Im by images of candle flicker, farewell breath on winter's window. Essence lingers in these shadow walls. Dickinson, Browning, desire echoes connecting time passages here in this moment. Their voices stir emotions within me. I give you heart red flow on yellow parchment. Blood beats, quicken, Byron, Gibran, pounding quiet serenity. We savor words, inhaling the air that surrounds us, grasping at bits and pieces of syllables. Keats, Shelley, form round our lips. We taste offerings dipped in mother tongue, long-stemmed flutes elicit remembrance. We touch, fingers ease unhinged, sensual rise. You, my poem, wrapped around silken threads of feather quill, whisper brushed air, faint traces wash over us softened with our kiss. And I call to you, beloved, eyes caress, ghost lovers give courage, give heart. My heart flows into red parchment, this craving within, between pages, a kiss, a supple touch, gentle heart, Farewell, portals of dusted pages. We all know, thank you, um, how a poem writes itself. Well, uh, this poem was written by my dog, Lila. Um, every morning and every um, afternoon after, after supper, we would walk around the block. And we got home one day and sat on the couch and she said, hey, because I got this really cool poem. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> give it to me. So uh, this is called On the Porch. Uh, her name was Lila. On the porch, old man swings in homemade hammock. Spring rain had just fallen. Air was heavy in thought. Brother stood between the pillars. Not a word was spoken between them. Of course, he had been dead a few years. It just didn't seem to matter, less beer he had to share. Neighbor kids, they run back and forth just daring for some reaction. On the porch, old man sits in rocker, big toe at work. Tropical winds blown from some remote island he read about in some outdated travel magazine. Hair tussles on the side. Sister sits beside him, knitting needles flash. Sparks sink through the cracks. Of course, she had been dead since the summer before. He still turns his head. She knows all his secrets. Next door neighbors slink up the way both get out passenger door, avoid any reaction. On the porch, old man sits on third step, paint peels leaving layers of the past. Sun slides down. Best friend stands at gate, hinges rusted, missing slats, gum and wire keep it up. Yells something about a $20 bet to this day, still believes Buckner booted ball just so he would lose. Goddamn son of a bitch. He smiles and waves, I'd like you to meet my brother and sister. Of course, he wishes he were dead, but you can't have it all, even on the porch. Screen door opens, silent figure waits, arms fold, she shakes her head, lets out a sigh. Corners of her mouth slide upward. 30 years, 
30 years on the porch. Sometimes it feels like yesterday. Takes his hand and feels the boy. Tomorrow, tomorrow, you can come out and play on the porch. So we're going to take a quick photo short break, and we'll be back with Yaya, Jean-Denis, and Leonardo. So welcome back, everyone. So before we move on to our featured poets, we have one more for our open mic. So I would like to introduce Trish Clinton. It's so good to be back, uh, everybody. So it's called uh, Beautiful Mistakes. Your mountain is waiting, so be on your way. You have a choice to go or stay. You aren't so sure, for the world has chewed you up and spit you out. Your life is full of uncertainty and doubt. The shoulda, coulda, wouldas flood through your brain. It's a series of unfortunate events filled with pain. You make a choice. Is it just a beautiful mistake? There's nothing less satisfying when it's wrong and you're left with heartbreak. But each little thing life has brought, lessons are learned, the problem can escalate no matter which way we turn. It's killing me each day that we're apart, though it doesn't seem to matter to you much. There's a barrier you put up, a force field, that I can't get through or touch. We have a life that demands accountability, regardless if expressing emotions are your greatest disability. I can only say and do so much. I want those feelings that couples feel something substantial, meaningful, and real. I want to hear how much I mean to you. Is it just a broken part of you that keeps you in fear? Realizing people aren't kind, it gets into your head. No one will be able or be capable of showing you that they care. It's easier to remain shut off, block off anything from coming through, but it keeps you stuck in a rut, an empty one-sided view. Mistakes seem messy, but if you learn from them, it's such a beautiful sight. Lessons learned that went wrong now seems right. Fractured pieces of yourself seem to come together. The foundation built much stronger, withstanding any stormy weather. So I have you, I've got you, even if you've resisted until now. Step into the unknown and you'll make it somehow. Believe in love again. And what more can you lose? I'll respect you however you choose. It's a difficult decision, so don't make it rash. It's better to do it clear-headed. If done so quickly, it's like a car going 60 in a 30 and surely will crash. Don't you realize how close we've gotten over the past few months? There's nothing keeping me from you. It's a crazy little thing that many call love, though it's not something you say, but an action you do. So let's step out together and make these life-changing steps that you could take. It's a mistake at to some, but worth the risks to others. Will you make this challenge and try it out? It could be the best thing that you ever did. The biggest feeling that won't go away is regret. It's a complicated measure where you've thrown away every treasure and why? Because someone broke your heart and made you cry? Get over it, get on with it, it's now or never. Who better to take the plunge with but me? If you don't see it as a possibility, then let me go, cut ties, and set me free. Know that these COVID days and nights were tolerable because you were here. It's not anything I've taken for granted, and I will always hold dear. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our student poet, Yaya Blake. Yaya was 
original, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her before we move on. I know we are all very excited. Um, she was originally scheduled to be our student poet in March of 2020, uh, but there were some unforeseen circumstances, of which I think we are all aware. So I'm very excited that we get to hear from her today. Um, so just a little bit about her in her own words. Um, my name is Ayanna Blake, but everyone calls me Yaya. I'm a soon-to-be junior with a passion for writing. Taking my work and having a place to share it is freeing for me. My poems are almost always about my deep and personal feelings. I hope that when I speak, each listener hears a piece of me. I think we're all looking forward to hearing that. All right, welcome, Yaya Blake. Um, hi. Uh, so I have four poems to read today. Um, and the way I set it up is my first poem is how I present myself and how people perceive me. Um, the two poems in the middle are more of an insight to my personal feelings and struggles. And the last poem is a happy poem about being okay in a moment. Um, so this first one is titled, Who Am I? Um, brown hair, brown eyes, and brown skin. Big heart, big stomach, and wide eyes. Bright wide eyes that like to see all the things that bother me. Spacious is my brain to contain the great flame of ideas and creations that I hope will spark change. <sighs> There's not enough space to play chase in this race to compete for a place in your good grace. Gone is the patience that was never there before. Yes, I do say. Yes, I do dare. No, I won't stop. And no, I don't care. Fear? I'm not afraid. Um, I'm already in pain, sadness, anger, and rage. Okay, so maybe a little afraid. Head held high, eyes to the sky, voice raised in a constant outcry. Arms wide open, ready to attack, I will fight back. I won't be caged, contained, peace won't be maintained. I am loud, I am proud, never am I cowed. Um, so back <coughs> when, I feel like everyone had issues with like mental health during COVID. Um, it sort of hit us from the side, and I feel like everyone had a bit of their own struggle. Um, so this is a poem that I started while I was going through my struggle, um, and my family was helping me like support and get me out. Um, and I felt like no matter what I was doing, I was hurting somebody. Um, so, why does me getting right seem to make everyone else wrong? To tell you to get help, seek support, get better. But every time you move forward, you push people back. I repel my healing by creating someone else's scars. Who knew my tears could hurt someone more than they hurt me? I didn't know the truth could break apart happiness so easily. Happy, happier. What is happiness? Where is my happiness? It was here, I'm sure, a moment ago. Where did it go? It's not in your smile or in his laugh. It's not in the grades or the <laughs> accolades. Is it hiding in the success, sneaking by the failures, fleeing from the tiredness? Is it screaming with the other voices? Where is it? They tell me to get right, but getting right makes everything wrong. The looks are wrong, the smiles are forced, the easy silence is now crushing. Everything's crushing. I'm drowning, I'm dying, I can't breathe. Save me. But who am I asking? The damsel in distress is the villainous. I am the monster. It's my fault. My tears are weapons, and I use them on purpose. I am selfish. It's my doing. My words are poison, and I use them on purpose. I'm wicked. I'm to blame. My actions are impulsive, and I do it all on purpose. I'm broken on purpose. I'm selfish. I'm wicked. I'm evil. I'll take your happiness. I take it and it's mine. Though I can't use it, I'll steal it. I'll rip it from you, and I'll do it on purpose. Being wrong makes me reckless. Getting right makes me wicked. Doing nothing makes me selfish, and doing something makes me heartless. And all of this comes out so easily when you ask. So simply I say as if it were true. Don't worry, I'm okay. Just how can I help you? This one is titled Perfection. Um, I am an academic. 
So my grades have always been important to me. Um, and again, during COVID, it's very hard to maintain who you thought you were because everything's kind of flipped on its head. Um, and I feel like a lot of time people, a lot of people spent time thinking about who they are. Um, so I tell myself I will not cry. There are no tears. I tell myself I have no fears when I know damn well what hides out there. I am sure I am not lost, but I cannot find out where I am meant to be. I laugh, if only to convince myself that I am happy. See the bags under my eyes? The tear stains on my pillow say otherwise. I am confident in my ability to be unable to decide what to do, how to respond, what to say. In a moment, I am swallowed by the shallows of the depths of my mind, lost to the flow of thoughts that lead to second-guessing, force-fixing, and childish fleeing. I am a slave to my own expectations, weighed down by hope, dreams, and aspirations. I lie to justify why the smiles run dry, the look in my eye, and why every word sounds like goodbye. I deny the fact that I need help. It is easier to pretend I can untie the messy knots of my life while they strangle me. I am here, present, hundreds of miles away. I'm floating in the space between today and every yesterday, lost to the rhythm of my life's replay. Every moment, comment, question, it's all on display. The mistakes watch me. They know me. They own me. I owe them to be better, to know every letter of every error, to memorize the blunder, to know every flaw. I must have perfection, yet perfection has me. And this last one's about my girlfriend, um, and she's very supportive. My entire friend group is, um, and we support each other, and it's good to know that even when everything's crazy, that you have people that you can rely on, family and friends, so. It's her in every space between the moments and every breath that leads to thought. It's her in every smile that I crack and every glance and dramatic gesture. I could sit and listen for hours to the sound of her laughter. I didn't mean to give her so much power. Her obsessions are my passion. I know her style of fashion. I know the smirk she makes in satisfaction. I know there is no end to the story she can't imagine. I know how she hates an action. Yet I know I only understand a fraction of her second generation Latin. I know how high a grasshopper jumps and how fast a butterfly flies. I know her birthday is in July. I know why she likes the color green, though it never appealed to me. But now green is beautiful and musical. I can hear her voice in the lines of every leaf. I can find each key in nature's melody, the different shades on every tree. I swear the world never looks so free. I remember when we had our first kiss. It was bliss because I knew that she knew that we knew. We had no idea what to do. But I was with her soaked in the rain and she was with me soaked in the rain, so we were okay. Did I tell you that she sings? I swear she grows wings. As she swings to each half note and flings through the whole notes and spins her way to the last note. But um. It's her in the haze of every perfect dream. It's her on every paper that I pen. I love it when she calls me darling. I call her love. Yet her names become irrelevant because her name is my name and my name is hers. But there's nothing more precious than my name when she lays next to me and whispers only to me, I love you. I swear those words never meant so much. I swear I've never heard those words enough. I'm addicted to the sounds, to the looks, to the feelings. Her, it's her. She's perfect, she's a wreck. She's nothing I would ever expect. I'd promise to be perfect for her, but to her, our imperfections are perfect. So I'll be imperfect together with her. So were we just wowed? So on three, let's hear that word. One, two, three. Wow. Thank you, Yaya. That was incredible. Amazing. Um, so we have our features coming up now.
I would like to introduce Jean-Denis Joachim. He is a poet, fiction writer, playwright. He has four published collections of poetry. He created the Many Voices Project, inspiring conversations about race and equality. He is the director of City Night Readings, a series featuring diverse poetic talents. He is adjunct professor at Bunker Hill Community College, and he serves on the board of the New England Poetry Club. <coughs> my friend, my brother, life is good, Jean Denis. Thank you, Philippe. Greetings, everyone. Hi. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, it is on everyone's mind. The president of Haiti was assassinated last week. My name is Jean Dany Joachim. I was born there. And I'm here this afternoon to share poetry with you. So let's just address it so we can move on. Okay. This is the 21st century. We live in the 21st century. There is no way a president can be assassinated with a plot for the time that we're living now, it was an intercept somewhere. When a lone lunatic hides in the basement trying to create any type of conspiracy, the world has all the capabilities to intercept that communication and to prevent the danger that this sole lone lunatic could do. So, that's the first thing. And the second thing I will say about that, mark my words. You can even read my lips as if I were a politician if you want. I may not live long enough to see it. Haiti will not perish. That nation will rise again to take its place in history. So, thank you. I am honored. I am happy to share the stage this evening with uh, Leonardo Nin. He's my brother. He raised me el mano del otro lado de la isla. Leonardo Nin is a Dominican writer and one of the main representatives of the Dominican diaspora literary movement. He is the author of several books of short stories, including Guazabaras and Sacrileges of the Ex Excommunicated, and of the novels I only know they call her Shadow and Tomorrow. When God Died. His latest book of poetry, Poems in Black and White, was published in 2013. And in 2018, the, the Dominican Commission of Culture in New York awarded Leonardo Nin the 13th Primo, Primo Literario Letras de Ultramar for his play, Las Polfiadas. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy, I'm honored. We're going to celebrate poetry with you. We're going to share what we love the most with you. So. And thank you for the welcoming and for the opportunity for the celebration. Um, Jan Dani and I decided to do this reading together because you seldom see poets from both sides of the island of Hispaniola celebrating poetry quality, love, humanity. So we chose to do that together as a way to show the world that we are actually more similar than what they have made us believe. That language is just 
and a statement of the guy who colonized one side or the other. And that's the end of it. But before we start reading, I would like, we have an agreement between poets where what we usually do is, sometimes there are poets that cannot read, that they are shy, or they don't have the ability to travel, like some of us do. So whenever, whoever, um, if any one of us travels anywhere, we usually choose one poet, absent poet, and we read a poem of his or hers. So this is a poem from New York poet Harris Chiefs. We met in Costa Rica about 10 years ago. And the poem is called My Brother. And it sounds like this. My brother, my dear brother, I can see the affliction and sadness in your eyes. And I can see you gazing at the window, ready, ready to jump to the other side. But before you do that, I wanna tell you something. My brother, my, bre my dear brother, before you jump, please empty your pocket and give me what you have. <laughs> All right. The Great Harry Sheets from New York City. The first poem I'll read you, forgive me, everything I'll read this afternoon will be dedicated to, to Haiti, and you will understand why. And why don't you do the Dodo La Son, let's engage the public into the Dodo La Son. Let's okay, everybody. Okay, okay. okay. Since we celebrated the Haitian tradition, and we celebrated Haiti as a country, a country that, like Jan Dani said, is going to overpower this, and it's gonna come above Definitely. better and stronger. So let's, in Creole? Definitely. So, Leonardo wants me to teach you a song, and I hope you agree to be part of it. We have done it before. And it works. It's simple. It goes like that. Vivi dodo la chalmando vivi. And that's the song. Check this out. Vivi, for a point by the woman. Vivi dodo la chalmando vivi. So we have it. We got the lyrics. One more time. Vivi. Dodo la chalmando vivi. And now check this out. Vivi dodo la chalmando vivi. You see, we got it. Let's see. Vivi. Do do la chalma do vivi. So imagine, this is the place where I, I was born. This is the place where I grew up. At night, every now with friends, you sing a song, and then poetry comes. Can you imagine everything that was read here tonight, this afternoon? There was a song, this song behind it. Imagine the beauty of that. So we're gonna keep doing that this evening, okay? Let's do it one more time. Vivi do do la chalma do vivi. On the other side of happiness, on the other side of happiness, there is a land and its people born in adversity. A story torn by treason. They are the gods who, are, who have fled from too many prayers. There is nature, sweet and wild at the same time. The sun that dries up, that land that drinks its own blood. The stars that are getting further and further away, the moon that wobbles. There's a woman and her loves, her husband who thinks he is God and challenges the future. They are the children who grew up fast 
and collide with the burden of life. On the other side of happiness, words lose their true meaning. They are all these roads ahead. They are still the people forgetting themselves in the time that passes. There is reason that lost its face. There is friendship that is tied up. The comb is stabbed. There is that much we think we know and all that we ignore. On the other side of happiness, death goes unmasked. Life is aborted. There is love and slave, joy stymied. There are so many hands that never touch each other. On the other side of happiness, on the other side of happiness, everything goes the wrong way. The way is strewn with regrets. On the other side of happiness, there is hope. There is hope. Vivi, do, do, la, shalma. My grandpa became a tree. One morning when no one expected, he came silently and started digging on the soil and dug beyond where the minerals and hatred, where the earth doesn't belong to anybody. And yes, my grandpa became a tree because that morning quietly, he put his feet, opened his arms, and from his nappy hair, turned into a tree that birds and animals come today. And this morning, we sit around to remember his arms opening, giving us his shadow. Vivi, do, do, la, shalma, do. My country comes from the belly's water. Mon pays vient du ventre de l'eau. My country comes from the water's belly. Nobody knows it swims better. It's changing moods. It is with the waves which come to tickle its feet that it learned to dance. It is also its mirror to fix up its makeup or ascertain what's left, the devastated mountains, its disappearing trees, its corset wide open to the sun. And in the evening when the sky is celebrating, from there come its glimmers of color. But when the wind wants, wants it its way and makes war against the clouds, when all the waters in the sky plunge down towards my little corner of land, and when the waves roar around it, it trembles and feels betrayed. The water rips up its clothes, takes away its children, twists its guts, and washes away its tears. The country I come from comes from the water's belly. My country knows the water's joy and its contents. From the Cimarron, I learned that the river 
can see your soul because the water has eyes. From the water I learn that persistence cannot be stopped and eventually ends to where it has to go. And yes, we got there after the ice guards call us dogs. And they said that the caravana people were coming to take everyone. They were gonna take the country. We were just running away because from the water I learned that time is something that cannot be stopped. And yes, it was a simple children's song. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Those were the first letters I learned in English. Because from the word I learned that words transcend culture, race, and love. A, B, C, dad, mom, sister. Only one made it out of the caravan people. And today, with the things I learned from the water and the words that I learned that the rivers can teach you, I come back to the Rio Grande to show you, Mom, Dad, that I made it and I am safe. V, V, Do, Do, La, Shalma, Do, Nous les pays moins, la ligne al fiancé, oh. Sous nous les pays moins, la ligne al fiancé, oh. Nos cochons, ma dichon, ti bouto. I'm sorry, I'm in my country right now. <laughs> And this poem goes like that. Je choisirai le silence. Je choisirai le silence. I will choose silence. In times like this, that's what you do. Je choisirai le silence. Words, my body, my soul, the universe of a world finally clear. Words without muscles that go to the open sea without masters and without fear. Words that do not leave a shadow on the road. Simple words without contours, words of cadence that journey on the page of my life. What to say of this frantic race towards ugliness? What to say? of this frantic race towards ugliness. I will choose silence. I will choose silence. When I will have nothing more to say, I will peace on my leftover words and take my leave without regrets, like silence. I will part with their taste in my throat and the sweet symphony of their harmony And I will wipe away the tears of my angry words, their venom, too harmless compared to human stupidity. Je choisirai le silence. Je choisirai le silence. I will choose silence. I will choose silence. Vivi. Do, do, la, shalma, do, vi, vi, bamboleo, bamboleia, porque mi vida yo la prefiero vivir así, bamboleo, bamboleia. Porque mi vida yo la prefiero vivir así. Mamá. Yes, mamá. 
Today, perhaps, you will sit in down on your blue chair, staring how the clouds become rain in the mountains. I will remember your words telling me that the rain was the cry of happiness of God blessing us every single day. Except, Mama, is that behind this cage, all I could see a sign that says, Welcome to the United States. Vivi do do la shalma do vivi Offering, offering. I am the poem without words. I am the poem without words. I will not be read or said aloud. I must now stand aside as I leave the page as an offering. Come and come all to write the collective voice. Write the redemption poem. Write your slogans from the last protest and whispers of endless nights of prayers. Write down the path to follow. Write your hopeful days. Write all that is said, all that is heard, along with the children's dream, with their colors and divergences. Write the land as it stands. Write the land as it stands. Let the page be a mirror. I am the poem without words. I will not be read or said aloud. Here, I take my leave. Vivi do do la shalma do vivi. And for me, it was a true honor to share my poetry with you. Thank you very much. It's up to them. <laughs> I, I know we started late, so it's time to go home. But we have we can read you until tomorrow. We can read for you until tomorrow and the day after. So. Okay, go for it. <laughs> so let's let's make love with them. Let's do love for okay. them. Okay let's, make, okay. okay. let's make love. Te espero. Te espero. You're going to have to do automatic translation after, okay? So yeah. Te espero. Je marche sans compter mes pas. Je marche sans compter mes pas. Je ne veux plus me rappeler que mille fois j'ai contourné la ville à ta rencontre. Je ne veux plus me rappeler que mille fois j'ai contourné la ville à ta rencontre. J'ai vu d'abord le soleil, puis la lune et les étoiles. Et j'ai vu le soleil, la lune puis les étoiles, et je marche, et je marche, et je marche. Te espero. I walk without counting my steps. I do not want to be reminded that countless times I have circled the city to meet you. I have seen first the sun the moon, then the stars. And I have seen the sun, the moon, and the stars. And I walk, and I walk, and I walk. This period. I wait for you.
Camino sin contar. You are supposed to do the Spanish <laughs> one. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to do it in Spanish. Oh my God. Camino sin contar mis pasos. Let's do it. Oh, do you know Yeah. Anglais, ok. Ok, ok, ok. Voilà, voilà, voilà. I walk with, without counting my steps. Sin caminar, sin contar mis pasos. I do not want to be reminded no quisiera ser recordado that a thousand times que miles de veces I have circled the city to meet you. He dado vueltas en la ciudad para encontrarte. First, I see the sun, Primero veo el sol, then the moon, y la luna, and the stars. Y las and again, I see the sun, y de nuevo vuelvo a ver el sol, and the moon, y la luna, and the stars. Y las estrellas. And I walk, Yo camino, and I walk, y camino, and I walk. Y camino. <laughs> That is love. <laughs> Poetry transcends words. That just the tone of the voice, even though you don't know the meaning of it, it invites you to a different level of humanity. That level that makes us love each other that has prevented us from destroying one another for so many generations, for so many times in history. So that's why we do this exercise with poetry in different languages. More love? Yeah. Are you saying no for love? <laughs> <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> okay, tenemos eso aquí. Okay. Podemos hacerlo yeah. sin, sin falta. Okay. Uh, This, this one is called A Prayer to Love. A Prayer to Love. Le temple était bien calme ce matin. Même les saints étaient endormis. Trois fois, j'ai murmuré ton nom comme dans une prière secrète pour implorer le Dieu de l'amour. Et ton sourire m'est apparu. Et ton amour m'a illuminé. Et j'ai prié en abondance pour anticiper ton retour. Una plegaria del amor. El templo estaba en calma esa mañana. Incluso los santos dormían. Tres veces murmuré tu nombre como una plegaria escondida para implorarle a Dios del amor. Y tu sonrisa se me apareció. Y tu amor me incendió desde adentro y yo recé en abundancia. Espero tu regreso. A prayer to love. The temple was quiet this morning. Even the saints were asleep. Three times, three times I whispered your name as in a secret prayer to implore the God of love. And your smile appeared to me. And your love lit me from within. And I prayed abundantly, waiting for your return. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Life is good. Thank you. Life is good. Life is good. So can we give a round of applause to John Denis Leonardo, Yaya, our people on the open mic, Kelly Gates and Paul Engel from the Brockton Library who gave us this space. And we will see you in September. So have a good August, and we're going to do it all again, because everyone has a voice, and words matter.
Bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Yaya, for sharing your work with us today. It was amazing. I have, do have a few questions for you. I'd love for you to answer. Um, so when did you first realize that you wanted to be a writer? Probably when I was like nine years old. Um, up until I was, I'd say, seven, I didn't want to read. Like, I just I hated reading because I didn't understand the point of it. Like, if it didn't have pictures, why was I reading it? Um, but as I explored more books, my great-grandmother got me into reading again. Um, and as I realized how many different universes and worlds you could create with words, I started fooling around with it, and then I wanted to make my own stories and my own magic. Um, so, yeah. I loved it, and I, I felt the magic for me when you were reading. Um, so what does your family think about your writing? Um, my parents are supportive. That's why they're here today. Um, my parents have definitely fueled my reading and writing obsession. Um, my mother had us reading when we were three. Like she, she jumped right on that. My brother, I, re I started reading at a college reading level when I was in fifth grade. Um, my brother is not far behind. I think he was eighth grade last I checked, going on ninth grade reading level, and he's only 11. Um, so we read at home. It's a big part of our culture. My father is a reader too. Um, like He'll just bring us books and be like, here you go. Um, so they're very supportive. This is the first time my parents got to hear my poems, and it is very freeing because they were directly related to most of them. And it was sort of like getting to talk to them without talking to them. Um, as a librarian, I loved hearing everything that you said about reading and how important it is to you, and your parents sound amazing. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for encouraging this. Um, so what is, actually, let's go back to this one. Um, has your idea of poetry changed at all since you started writing poems? Yeah, I used to think it had to rhyme. <laughs> I thought that was a requirement for something to be a poem. Like, I thought it had to rhyme. Um, and it wasn't until, actually, I met Philip when he came to, like, uh, my school um, and with Miss Smith, and he showed us, like, his poems that I realized how diverse poetry could be. Um, and then I read the Iliad, and I was like, you can tell whole stories with poetry? Okay. Um, like, the poetry here tonight that included music really hit close to home. And I didn't know you could include music and poetry. But now that I've seen it, it seems like such an obvious thing. Like, I should have thought of it before. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing some yaya -ya music mixed into your poetry next time. <laughs> um, so are you on social media? And if so, how does that affect your writing? I just got on social media like a month ago. My parents... My parents, my parents weren't into that. It was, it was books, just, just, just the books, just the books, up. and all the aunties and the tatties. So it was either deep conversations or books. Um, so it doesn't really. I wouldn't say that it affects my writing much. Okay, um, it might be an opportunity to share later, but I can see why your mom would emphasize the books person again as a librarian. Yeah. Um, so, last one before we go. If you could pass along one piece of advice for other young writers, uh, what would it be? Write what you want to write and not what you think people want you to write. Uh, also, your, your English teachers are wrong. Um, it, they're, they're all wrong. It, it doesn't matter. Um, they're literally each year, it's just going to keep changing. Like that formula that you spent so long practicing is going to be irrelevant by like ninth grade and they're going to yell at you for using it. So never stop being creative because you're just going to have to learn to be creative all over again. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Yaya, and thank you for sharing your work with us today. It was an absolute pleasure. No problem. Well, thank you guys for. Um for reading today. It was fantastic. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the first question we have is, uh, can you describe an early experience where you learned that language had power? To pick just one makes my memory juggles, but I was fortunate enough that I met a poet in my neighborhood who was also an actor. So I was friend of his house and 
I think through him I understand the power of words because at the same time he had a radio show. He was part of a radio show in the afternoon, every afternoon at two o'clock. So I could tell his words were different and they were about the country already, artistically. But nevertheless, I could feel the difference at that time. Beautiful answer. Thank you. Leo? Yeah, for me, it was a little bit um, slightly different. I come from a very poor family, from Abate in the south of the Dominican Republic. Um, the literacy level is quite, yeah, it's quite high. So most of the oral traditions, most of the knowledge gets carried um, as a way of, of sharing not only love and experience, but also the knowledge from previous generations, so from grandfathers. So I remember everybody in the afternoon would go to my house, talk to my grandfather, um, the neighbor, they would, they would just share coffee, and start talking and telling stories. And I, I was able to get to know the, the history of the town, who had died, people that were no longer there, and that kind of showed me or started giving me an idea of the power of, of that element of carrying that, that oral tradition of our ancestors um, through, through just voice and words and sounds. Yeah. yeah. And you imagine music played a part in that too. It did. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I actually have an experience in my town. There was a guy named Arturo Mendez, and I hope that anybody from oh, the Dominican sure. Republic is here. The guy just grabbed all the kids from town and started teaching music to every kid in town. He created a town of musicians. And those who cannot read or write, he taught them percussion. You know, he, he showed them a tray because now with tourism, those kids were the ones playing for the tourists ah, at the beach. So created, he made a difference based on that tradition of sharing. And, and that's why I would like, every time I have an interview, I usually remember him to kind of honor him, what, yeah. what he did for. No, that is good. As you said that, what I forgot to say, as I mentioned that person, I never said his name, is <laughs> Jean Rodrigue Montfleury. He was known as Tonton Wowo. Yeah, he's the first one, the first voice. Yeah. All right, let's hit question number two now. Um, how long did it take you to start sharing your poetry after you started writing poetry? Yeah. Poetry early was Okay, I, I came from a tradition where you write to, to say, to read, you know, everything was memorized in your head. I used to have all my poems in my head until I, I started living in the States, where I, I started to live in the culture of reading. But I had everything from the first to the last poems in my head. Uh, so... We write to read right away. You write it and you read it to to the next person, to my house, you know, to my aunt, to my cousin, so my inside the house at night when everybody is, is in bed and then you reciting poetry or saying thanks. Yeah. So much of this is re relatable to me as a musician. <laughs> you know, the, the idea of the head arrangement, you know, you keep all your Oh yeah, there. it's right there, yeah. right there. I learned how to read music, you know, ten years after I started playing. So. Yeah. Well, now I'm trying very hard to to get back to remember everything, but it's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and I I agree with with you guys. Sometimes, like, what makes us as artists special, also make us extremely different, yeah. and also and those force us into kind of a, this introspection. Mm -hmm. Because art for us it, it, it is at a different level, and sometimes you cannot express the abstraction going through your brain. In a normal conversation between friends, you're afraid they will not understand what you're thinking or feeling. That's why we get along so well. Because <laughs> you know, <laughs> artists say, "Hey, you know, I got this idea about you know this happened about social justice, about you know unhappiness, about you know whatever topic, whatever human condition." You know, so for me, it's cool. Was you know, I was an introvert. Somebody said, "Hey, you are the, the little boy." I used to call me the little boy, because at an earlier age, I started to like you know writing and things like that, and that's how I started sharing my work. And I got a job at, when I was 
13, 12, writing short stories for a, um, a, a children's program. So I, I used to write some of the stories from the children's perspective. So they used to use me because I needed the child, the child's, I, you know, mine. So yes. that kind of eased me into the writing and, uh, sharing, and sharing. sharing because I was already, I had the adults, um, how you call it, support and say, hey, this is good, this is bad, or this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. So that's how it, it started, yeah. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, number three, uh, how do you think you have evolved as a writer over the years? It's a loaded question. <laughs> well, no, but it, for me, that's, that's a, a good one. Yeah. Because um, in my, my, my life as a writer, there was a moment when I realized that fame was something that I might not gain out of it. And I realized that it might not happen, that I wouldn't become sprinting, I wouldn't become, you know, nobody known, that probably the people who know me would be my friends and whoever is in my immediate surrounding. And at that moment, I said, you know what? Perhaps I will never become famous, but I, I can't stop writing. Amen. And I just freed myself at that moment in my life when I realized like, okay, I made it as an artist because I'm not bound anymore by the approval, by the idea of what people are gonna think, think. the self censorship that we impose on, impose on ourselves, thinking about, okay, what are they gonna think of me if I write this? Because you're no longer bound by acceptance from others, you just create in that setting, not even expecting that people would even read it. So that gives you a different, at least in my, my case, it wasn't to say, you know what, I don't care. Doesn't matter. I'm enjoying this and doing this, these venues, you know, reading to, you know, 20 people, five people, six people, just sometimes going to get the, get the knee or Lois, my friend, and a bunch of friends, and just having a beer and mm -hmm. reading a poem. That's enough, because you find a, a different level of, of existence sure, as an artist. I can't agree more. Mm -hmm. uh, for me. Art is a way of, is my way of living. I, I did not know, I've been writing all my life, but writing was never, it has never been my profession. I'm still waiting because I had to survive all my life. You know, I had to do something. I have to work, I have to keep a job. So I do write, I get lucky. I, I have so many unfinished projects, yeah. perhaps, when I retire, I can focus just on on have fun with the art of words. I wish that they will come soon, but uh, accomplished writer, I mean, I have published a few books. I have many more that, you know, manuscripts and things I could sit and finish, but I don't have the time to, to just do that because we have to exist in, on, in other forms. Unfortunately, but that time will come. It might come. It will come. Yeah. It will be good when it does. Um, if not poetry, what art form would you use to express yourself? I mean, the art of words to me, it's words. It, it is. Yeah, if it's not poetry, you write a play. If it's not a play, you sing a song. If it's yeah, the art of words, we, we will stay there. Uh, and I will learn something else if the opportunity comes. I will. You both have excellent voices. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And for me, it would probably be music. Yeah, yeah music. Because yeah. uh, it's the closest thing to poetry. They sure. just like link to one another. But with writing, though, the voice, you know, saying, you know, it's, it's I feel. Uh, more direct connection. For example, to read a poem as today, my country comes from the belly's water, or I am the poem without words. You know, words can be so direct, so powerful, and I, I feel the sharing. You got it from the eyes of, of the audience as you do it. And I'm sure perhaps with a good piece of music, you feel the same too. Oh, yeah. But uh, words have this 
a old friend of mine, um, I was remembered this line from many years ago. He, he wrote a, a line, he said, words stand like monuments. Yeah. I always like that. They can. Yeah. They can stand. Yeah. Let's hit number five. Yeah, or did, you, did you answer that one yet? I, I said music. Oh, yeah, okay. I lost, <laughs> I lost track. Lost, lost, yeah. You have a terrible interviewer. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, tell us some of the influences that have inspired you as an individual. That, that, that's a loaded question. It is a long question. Because, I mean, at least I believe that nobody is self-made. I believe you're the collection of the people around you. I believe that, I, I, in one of my poems I said, and I am my mother, my father, my grandfather, my dog, mm -hmm. and I am the body without name on the corner. Because every, every human that we interact with yeah. is part of us. Whether it's good or bad, even most of, it, most of the uh, memories stay with you and they, they make you better mm -hmm. as a human, even the adverse interactions. So I believe that, I mean, influences, I could, for the sake of this interview, I'm going to look at the camera. I could sound, you know, pretentious and say, oh, yeah, you know what? I was influenced by Dostoevsky. I was influenced by, you know, Mozart and Nietzsche and start throwing names out there that nobody cares at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, art is humanity. It's, it's, it's that connection between us. Yeah. So if I were talk, talking about influence to rights, it would be humanity in general, like our human condition, our human element, our faults, our perfections, our you know, um, good things as, as a species, so, yeah. And our ability to steal with impunity. <laughs> That's true. <right. laughs> For me, I will say, my first influence goes back inside the house. Is this woman, there's no record that she has ever written a poem, but that's my aunt who raised me. It is from her, you know, she had notebooks from school, secondary school, with poetry, French literature that she will read to us. It is from her that I, and that's her first inside the house. And very early as a child when I, I started to read, I love reading, you know, I could read, read, read. I, I discover words and for me that I was always traveling in there. But after that, the house, I can name the people first, Jean-Rodrigue Bonfleury, that I said his name earlier, and after that, Gary Maniga, and then Kaplim, someone, uh, Evans Paul, but by his writing name, it's called Kaplim. I met these three poets when I, were, I was 13, 12 years old, so I was lucky. And these people, they were they're pioneers, you know, in theater, in poetry, the Creole language, the Creole language is amazing for arts and poetry. And they were considered on the top doing this. And, and my influence is all those adults, all those story telling at night, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of that. This is part of life and this is what makes us, this is why I could stand in a foreign country with singing Vivi, Dodola, Shalma, Do Vivi, with Leonardo, and, and it's accepted, goes. and it goes. And it's beautiful. So, thank you. All right, last one, guys. Uh, if you could pass along one piece of advice for other poets, what would it be? I don't know. I, I, I love words. I respect words. And I'll share that to people. Pay more respects to words you write and words you speak. That's a piece of my life. That's solid advice. For me, I'll say just love one another. Just because I mean, I, I was um, sharing earlier that I, I was so surprised on the the, the the shift of the country lately. It's so polarized with hatred, with all this messaging mm -hmm. of, you know, you have to be this against that, you have to be either black or white, you have to be always taking one side or the other and, and you know, just embrace the humanity as a poet. Leave what you write, that's it. 
live and live. You know, that, that would be the, my advice. Just embrace it and embrace humanity, embrace love and forget what you hear, differences, hatred, you know, all these things that they, it's constant bombardment on us as a society and it's, it's horrible. And if we who have, you know, the voice of, of love, the voice of humanity, do not embrace it, then we are off for a long trip as a species. So, yeah, yeah. just love each other. And it's really up to us. Exactly. As, as artists, as poets, as yeah. musicians, and writers, and painters. And That's it, yeah. To carry that message. Absolutely. Gentlemen, thank you for being thank here you. today. Thank you, thank you. I look forward yeah. to seeing you back here. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank thank you, you for you talking with me. It was an honor to be here yeah. reading in Brooklyn. Yeah. Thank you. Come back soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.